This is American History TV's Lectures in History podcast. This week, a class about President John F. Kennedy's foreign policy, from the failed Bay of Pigs invasion in Cuba to the Cuban Missile Crisis. It's taught by Iowa State University professor Charles Dobbs. All right, let's get started. So we're going to talk today about Kennedy foreign policy. And what's interesting about Kennedy's foreign policy isn't just the foreign policy, but the way he did things. Dwight Eisenhower, coming out of the military, believed in the staff system. He had a chief of staff for a while. It was a former general of his from the European theater, Walter Beadle Smith, Sherman Adams, the governor of New Hampshire, and paper flowed. And you could also tell he saw it and it came out. When Lyndon Johnson's president, his national security advisor, would give him whatever the proposal was and a piece of paper like a notepad piece with the numbers on it, number one, two, three, four, alternatives. Johnson would sometimes check it. Sometimes he'd check it and write a note. Sometimes he'd say, I don't like these choices and write a different thing. Richard Nixon would write longhand answers. President Kennedy, it would typically go in. It's interesting, Kennedy's secretary was named Lincoln and Lincoln's secretary was named Kennedy, by the way. It's kind of fun. It would say, Mrs. Lincoln, would you see if the president wants to read it tonight? And you never know if he read it. He probably did, but you don't have a reaction. What historians would love to see is, yes, I agree. No, I don't. He's an idiot. She's terrific. That country, we should beat on him. Something. It's very hard to actually find Kennedy directly involved in foreign policy, other than the reminiscences of people who were in the room. And one of the things that characterizes his aides, different than the aides to other presidents, they were all incredibly good writers. In fact, several were speech writers or historians. And they wrote wonderful accounts of him. So it's hard to get at what really happened. So he's an enigmatic figure. And it can just be tough at times trying to say what he did or what he didn't do or where he stood or where he didn't stand or, or whatever. Another thing is that the way he ran things. That is, you've seen the president has the Oval Office and they come in and talk and he's got various rooms sit around the table. Kennedy did things like a college bowl session that you could imagine the 20 year old guy sitting around the table passing the bottle of wine, talking and as they get progressively further down the bottle of wine, the talk gets a little more wilder. Uh, it was so bad that um, Dean Rusk will be his Secretary of State. I thought I put it up here. Dean Rusk will be his Secretary of State. He was a Rhodes Scholar from Georgia. He was an incredibly bright man, but this wasn't the way to him to conduct foreign policy. And he's actually known as the Buddha because he'd sit in meetings and not say a word because he just felt this isn't how you conduct foreign policy. And Lyndon Johnson, as vice president, in some ways was so distraught that he almost developed a drinking habit. So it's not that it's good or bad, but it's just very different. And for historians, it's just interesting to try and deal with Kennedy as president, as the nation's chief diplomat, compared to others where the records are better and people aren't so much trying to write favorable accounts and all that, that sort of thing. Also, when Kennedy became president, he told this story to Dean Rusk, and Dean Rusk tells this story later, so we're assuming it's true. The morning of the inauguration, usually the president-elect goes to the White House, greets the president, Mrs. President-elect greets Mrs. President. They shake hands, they eventually get in the limo, they ride up to the Capitol, and eventually go out on the portico and give the inaugural address. Eisenhower, in one of the few meetings he had with Kennedy after the election, said, I promise to support every foreign policy initiative you have, except if I read that in any way you or the administration is thinking of changing policy toward China, I will come out of retirement and lead the charge against you. So supposedly Kennedy said to Dean Rusk, his Secretary of State, as Rusk reported, Rusk reports that conversation, has Kennedy waggling at him and goes, if I read in the New York Times or the Washington Post that somebody in the State Department is thinking of changing China policy, you're fired. This doesn't matter at the moment, but when we get to Vietnam, it does, because there's a key set of documents. Was Kennedy going to withdraw troops or not? Was Johnson made a dramatic change to increase the involvement to all the ground troops, or was he following the trend line of Kennedy? And part of the evidence is that conversation where Kennedy stands on China, because the involvement in Vietnam ultimately revolves around US relations with China. So anyway, so Kennedy gets, it's time for Kennedy's inaugural address. And if you listen to his inaugural address, and I brought a copy, he makes it sound like things are really desperate. That is, during the election campaign, he claimed there was a missile gap. That is, somehow the Soviet Union had far more than we did, and we were at risk. And if you don't elect a Democrat to strengthen our defense, there could be problems. 
Eisenhower was upset because as a former general, the commander of forces in Europe, he knew there was no missile gap, but he couldn't say anything because that'd be violating an official secret. And he'd have to arrest himself, which would be kind of silly. You're under arrest. I am? Okay, here, I'll put on my handcuffs. So uh, Kennedy says that, and then when he becomes president, after saying, uh, greeting the president, the Chief Justice, Vice President Johnson, Vice President Nixon, President Truman showed up, whoever was there. He gets into his inaugural address, paragraph three. Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, in order to assure the survival and success of liberty. Were things that bad? No, they're not. We're bigger than the next two, maybe three economies in the world. Our military could beat any two or three single-handed. No. Uh, he then goes on. To those nations who would make themselves our adversaries, our adversaries, we offer not a pledge but a request to try and uh, quest for peace before the dark powers of destruction unleashed by science engulf all humanity in planned or accidental self-destruction. It's a pretty combative inaugural address. You can contrast it with Richard Nixon's in 1969 when Nixon says we should never negotiate from fear, but we should never fear to negotiate, which is a much more even keel thing. So anyway, so there's Kennedy. And then fairly early on, in talking about Kennedy, he'll announce Soon after taking office on March, uh, January 20, he announces the Alliance for Progress. Kennedy's idea was that we could help Latin America build up its economy, find work for people, better schools for children, that ultimately they would choose, though it's basically our capitalist democratic form of government, and not be tempted with the communist uh, system that's in place in Cuba and where, you know, in Europe and in China. And so he announces the Alliance for Progress. And, and it becomes an interesting situation because what happens? Well, over the course of the Alliance for Progress, the years of Kennedy and Johnson, those eight years, there's about $10 billion appropriated. Where does the money go, you ask? All right. It goes to pay off debt. The bulk of the money doesn't go into programs. The bulk of the money isn't even corruptly taken. It's mostly to pay back loans to banks. So to some extent, what does the American taxpayer dollars in Alliance for Progress do? Benefits banks that lent money to Latin American countries. So there isn't rather dramatic change. It's hard to say when it's over, ten, eight years later, what it achieved. And Richard Nixon will come up with a different plan just to get away from that because it wasn't real successful. So why does he announce it in March? Ah, ha, ha. Well, if one flips the page, because the next month will be the Bay of Pigs. Uh, the, the president of Cuba, uh, everyone, you know, was a dictator who perhaps was in league, league with the mafia because they owned gambling casinos in Cuba and big American agricultural interests, particularly around sugar. And there's a guerrilla movement started by uh, Fidel Castro. And in 1959, he achieved success. And to Eisenhower, this was an abomination, having a communist government, not just in South America, but 90 miles from Key West. Because, you know, if you first take Key West, Next, it'll be New Orleans, and they'll be in Ames before you know it. It's a good thing we're cardinal and gold because we got the colors already, you know, that kind of thing. So Eisenhower and the CIA, because he likes using the CIA, has this plan to overthrow the government in Cuba. That Cuban exiles in Miami will train them, will send them over, will provide some minimal support, is what Eisenhower wanted to do. They claimed the Cuban people were waiting for partisans to show up and help them throw off the yoke of communism. And Eisenhower plans it to take place in April 61 so that Richard Nixon, his vice president, who he hoped would win election, would have a great success three months after taking office. Well, of course, when Kennedy wins, Eisenhower briefs him on the plan. And Kennedy's an orthodox anti-communist. Why, sure, let's go ahead with it. As the time draws closer, Kennedy doesn't like the idea of US involvement. They were going to have unmarked planes, but they're mostly B-26 and B-29 bombers, which if you know planes, you'd identify as an American plane. And how did guerrillas get an American plane? You just can't go to Al's used plane shop and buy one you know, on the street. And the same thing with naval ships offshore to provide some covering fire for the Cuban exiles to land. Worse than that, Kennedy going ahead with the plan, but pulling back US support, assuming I could find the next right, there we go, next right page, is that newspapers printed stories of the attack ahead of time. So for example, the New York Times printed the story, <laughs> described where they were trained, 
where they were going to attack from Guatemala, where the attack was going to take place, because the Cuban exiles had no sense of being secret. In World War II, as we plan for Normandy Beach attack, it's not just Operation Overlord, the attack on German-held France, it's Operation Bodyguard, because Churchill famously said, we should protect the invasion with a bodyguard of lies. Ooh. They had no security. It wasn't just that it was in the Miami Herald and the New York Times. It was also, I could find the right document, the Washington Post reported that the Soviet Union knew about it. After the Soviet Union fell, KGB experts said, we had advance word. So if the Russians knew it was coming, and if the Miami and New York newspapers published that it was coming, what did I just do there? There we go. How did I make it go away? That's kind of cool. Please come back. Yeah, I'll turn it off and turn it on. How well could the Cubans do at keeping it secret? And the answer is, of course, not very well at all. The attack will take place. 1,500 go ashore. And a couple of them knew how to turn the light on. And a couple of them didn't. I think the bulb just burned down. How yeah, cool is that? Neat. At any rate, uh, 1,500 go ashore. And most of them are fairly quickly, oh, there we go, fairly quickly captured. They'll later on be ransomed for food and pharmaceuticals. But it's an absolute disaster. And the attack doesn't work. And what happens? Kennedy will take blame. The CIA director will resign. Remember, I mentioned the other day there was John Foster Dulles, who was Eisenhower's Secretary of State. His brother, Alan Foster Dulles, was the CIA head. Their sister, Eleanor Foster Dulles, was head of the policy planning staff. Alan Dulles is fired. It couldn't have worked from the get-go. But then what happens? Well, Khrushchev says he'd like to meet Kennedy. It'd be the, and since with Eisenhower, Khrushchev and Eisenhower meet at Camp David. Again, Walt Disney says you can't go to Disneyland. Then there's the U-2 incident, so Khrushchev uh, walks out of the planned summit with the Western powers, that is France, Britain, and the United States, to try and solve world peace. But when Kennedy becomes president, Khrushchev says we ought to meet. And they're going to meet in Vienna. Nice neutral location to meet in Vienna. And as Kennedy reported, assuming again I could find that overhead, there we go, Kennedy, it's, uh, Kennedy called it the worst day of my life. As he drove away from the Soviet embassy with Secretary of State Dean Rusk at the second of his two-day summit, the first day was held in the American embassy in Vienna, the second day was held in the Soviet embassy, Kennedy banged his hand against the shelf in the rear window of the limo. Rusk had been shocked that Nikita Khrushchev had been so rude to Kennedy, and uh, Rusk felt, in fact, all along that Kennedy was unprepared for Khrushchev's brutality. He was basically a Ukrainian peasant. He was coarse, he was loud, he was profane. He was big, not tall, but big, and he tried to do all that pushing around in Kennedy. And um, Kennedy felt that he'd been beat up. Let me see where I can find. Here we go. Uh, he uh, meets with the New York Times chief uh, editorialist, James Reston, and in an off-the-record session, Reston says, how was it, the meeting with Khrushchev at Vienna? Worst thing in my life, said Kennedy. He savaged me. Reston jotted in his notebook, not the usual bull. This is a look of a man who, how he, this is how he looks when he has to tell the truth. I've got two problems, Kennedy told Reston. First, to figure out why he did it and in such a hostile way, and second, to figure out what we can do about it. Kennedy had said to Khrushchev, Kennedy said Khrushchev thought anyone who was so young and so inexperienced as to get in the mess of the Bay of Pigs could see that he had no guts, so he just beat the hell out of me. I got a real problem. Well, what was the real problem after the Bay of Pigs? So they meet in Vienna. There's a nice little picture of them. A dark picture, because they couldn't afford lights. What can you say? And on the morning of June 4th, 1961, there we go, after Vienna, there it is. They'll start working on building the Berlin Wall. At late at night, German troops came out, East German troops. They put up simple sawhorse barriers at roads. They put down some uh, sandbags. They had local militias stay there. And then in the course of the next few months, they begin building the Berlin Wall. And over the years, the Berlin Wall will get bigger and bigger and bigger until you wind up with this massive complex where they knock down all the houses to create and buildings to create free fire zones, guard towers in the middle, dog tracks, anti-car kinds of things, you have to run into steel posts to get across. Why do they do it? Well, all along, a great many East Germans would go to Berlin, East Berlin, and then having gone to East Berlin, 
they would uh, cross the border and go into West Berlin. Then from West Berlin, they would travel to West Germany. How many? Well, a goodly percentage of all the trained East Germans, so not the bricklayers, but the engineers, the accountants, the scientists, the people that you want to train. That is, America talks about we don't have enough engineer students. We are all concerned with STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math. That's the ones leaving. And it's not just that they left to go to the West. It's the West German government bragged about it, which politically, in retrospect, was stupid. So they brag about all the East Germans leaving, and the East German government uh, says to the Soviet government, we're losing our most trained people. We can't train them as fast as they're leaving. Of course, it's a comment on the quality of life in East Germany compared to the perceived quality of life in West Germany, but it doesn't help them. So they build the Berlin Wall. And for a while, it seems to be one of the worst things imaginable. And uh, until it falls in 1989, I mean, I was sitting with a friend of mine in uh, his basement. And we're watching TV and seeing the wall come down. And you can't believe it. And if you ever go to the Patton Armored Museum at Fort Knox, which if you're at Fort Knox, you ought to go to the Patton Armored Museum, there is Checkpoint Charlie there. Someone cut out the main US to Soviet zone crossing. And you have the concrete and the barriers. And it's something that's about, oh, I don't know, about four yards wide. And you could stand there at the checkpoint, have your picture taken. And there's all the graffiti on the walls and stuff. And OK, maybe you all wouldn't do it, but I did. Because it's Checkpoint Charlie. It's just the thing you do. In fact, later on, I think I mentioned, did I mention? I can't remember if I mentioned, about the nickel with the um, microfilm inside that fell apart. And we kept it. Oh, so Gary Powers gets shot down with the U-2. He's supposed to kill himself. He doesn't. Uh, the plane survives. The camera survived. The film survived. And the pilot survives. Well, earlier, there's this, in New York, they have newspaper kiosks. You'll have a little kiosk, and people sell newspapers, maybe cigars, maybe candy, magazines, and just close it up at night. And nobody broke into it, because it's a little wooden thing. Well, there's a little boy selling. And this man, who obviously lived in Brooklyn, buys a newspaper for a nickel. The kid drops the nickel as the man walks away. It hits the ground, and it opens up. So imagine if you had a nickel in two pieces, and the top lifts off. And inside, there's a little black object. Well, he doesn't know what it is. So being a good kid, he goes to the local police department office. There's the desk sergeant behind the high desk, and he goes, look, and shows him the two pieces in this. Well, the sergeant knows that that's not typical. <laughs> so he calls the superior. Eventually, the FBI comes. Ooh. And they realize it's microfilm. And they realize this guy is a spy. And once they look at the microfilm, they realize he's the chief Soviet spy in the United States, Rudolf Abel. He gets captured. He never speaks. Other than thank you for the meal, he never talks. I mean, he's someone who was so committed to his cause, he never, ever talked. Eventually, he'll be exchanged for Gary Powers at Checkpoint Charlie. So if you're my age, Checkpoint Charlie's really cool. And if you could go, it's easier to go to outside Louisville, Kentucky, to Fort Knox than it is to go to Berlin to look at it if you're in this country. And then you get to see tanks. And if you're a guy, tanks are, you know, it's tanks. The tank that's in the Indiana Jones movie where they claim it's a German tank, it's a British World War I tank, they have one there. And if you're a military history professor, they let you get into it. Or stand inside the T-34 and look out. Cool. <laughs> so at any rate, so Kennedy's feeling buffeted a bit. The um, Bay of Pigs takes place, and he looks stupid. He meets with Khrushchev in Vienna. Khrushchev beats him up. Khrushchev builds the Berlin Wall, or the East Germans do, obviously with Russian approval and perhaps support. And it doesn't look good for the West. And so to Kennedy, it's, oh my god, this is not going well. There are some reverses elsewhere. And then will come the Great Crisis, which is the Cuban Missile Crisis. I was in a seventh grade in Philadelphia at a George Washington Junior Senior High School in the middle of crisis. Our teacher came in the room. He pulled down the blinds, he closed the curtains, turned off the lights, and told this group of seventh graders in social science class, you're all going to die. Ah! You know, and people are screaming, I've never kissed a boy, I've never kissed a girl, ever. we're all going to die. And then like three days later, no, you won't. Oh, OK. <laughs> I don't remember his name, but boy, I remember that scene, him walking in and going, oh, good Lord, what's going on? Well, what was going on? is that at the time, unknown to most Americans, and unknown apparently to me in class because I can't find the right piece of paper, I know it's here somewhere. Well, there's always a backup copy. If at first you can't succeed, find the backup copy. There we go. Unbeknownst to most Americans, we had, well, that boy, that came out really dark. We had missiles in Turkey and in Italy, so-called Jupiter missiles, aimed at the Soviet Union. 
And Russia, the Soviet government, didn't like that because we're threatening them. So what they wanted to do was both to protect Castro from any kind of plans. We had all kinds of strange plans against Castro. We figured if he's a Latin male, the hair on his face mattered to him. So we'd give him some strange shaving cream. That if he put it on his face to trim his beard, all the hair would fall out. We'd give him exploding cigars, like all the cartoons. And then he'd be embarrassed, and then he'd quit, or he'd have no hair on his face. He'd go, I have no hair on my face. I have to resign. I'm embarrassed. It's really, oh, it's not, it's not even 12-year-old boy stuff. It's really stupid stuff. But Khrushchev wants to do something to both say, I don't care for your missiles threatening me. I could do the same to you. And something also to protect Castro against US attack. And what he offers to do, and we understand now somewhat against the advice of his uh, fellow members of the Soviet leadership, the Politburo, to put offensive missiles in Cuba. As the word comes out in the summer and fall of 1962, what you're looking at is U-2 flights over Cuba. And if you realize how narrow Cuba is, it's long and narrow, the flight goes really fast. So if somebody wanted to shoot down the plane, you'd have to fire it before the plane touched Cuban airspace to hit it at the end, because it'd be gone. It's not like flying over the Soviet Union for five hours. And they have these pictures showing basically long, what look like tunnels to store the uh, missile, other long tunnels to store the bomb and the launch system, and barracks for 45,000 Soviet troops to be able to make the attack. Republicans will later charge that Kennedy delayed from September to October to bring the crisis to the American people. If they're right, why did he do it? Well, it's the same reason we talked about with Harry Truman going to Wake Island to meet Douglas MacArthur at the height of the second phase of the Korean War, it's the midterm elections, October 62, and a president who looks tough might keep his party from losing seats in Congress. I doubt that's the case, but that's the Republican charge. And what's interesting is the lead Republican was a senator from New York named Kenneth Keating. And in 1964, somebody ran against him for senator from New York. It was the president's younger brother, Bobby. Claimed New York citizenship, which was, eh, and runs against Keating, and of course, being a Kennedy, beat him. Kennedy's had a record for a while of never losing an election. And, and Keating walked away and said, last time I opposed a Kennedy and disappears into history. So they find these missiles there. What do you do? What do you do? Do you call up Khrushchev and say, what are you doing, dummy? Do you tell the American people? Do you send out an airstrike to attack the island? Do you want to have World War III over the sake of whatever's going on there? What do you do? So they formed a committee, a part of the National Security Council, but not the whole council which they called the executive committee because that's kind of a brilliant name, right? And they decided that was too obvious and too long, so they cut it down to XCOM. Because if you can name it something that people can't figure out what it means, you know. And they would meet in the White House to talk. And at the time, the White House mess wasn't open 24 hours a day. So they're meeting into the night, and they're hungry, so they call for takeout pizza. Afterwards, the reporters realize whenever some guy drives up and says, that'll be $42, please, there's probably a crisis going on. And they would look around for where the pizza orders were going. So like there's, you know, not, there's Pizza Hut here or Papa John's there or whoever there. And suddenly they're saying, hey, we got an order for 35 pizzas. Oh, where are you delivering it to? <laughs> the White House. Oh, OK. <laughs> we're going to go over and hang around the building <laughs> and see if we can find someone. So they meet. And they go through these alternatives. Should we bomb Cuba? Well, what if the Soviets bomb Turkey? Should we, and they, different kind, and they do call up troops, actually to Tampa, nationalized part of the guard and that sort of thing. But as they're sitting there, well, are the, are the missiles there yet? Well, what people thought was that the uh, sites for the missiles were there, and the actual tubes were there, but not the weapons. So they couldn't be fired yet because they weren't operational. And how are they coming? They're coming on Soviet merchant ships. So what could we do? Well, they didn't want to call it a blockade, because a blockade's an act of war. Technically, if you proclaim a blockade, you're at war. But John, John Kennedy's brother, Robert, had a better idea. He said, let's call it a quarantine. Because what do you use quarantine with? Disease. Nobody wants to go break a quarantine line, right? In the 1930s in this country, 20s, it was common to put up a sign around a house that tuberculosis or something else and quarantine. So people knew not to go in and play with the neighbors, not to call on your friend, not to walk to school, because it's quarantine. Quarantine sounds medical. It doesn't sound military. Right? Quarantine. It's a cool word. They call it a quarantine. And what they intended to do was sort of a slow dance. So if the Soviet ships are here in the central Atlantic, we'll get our Navy between them. And as they advance toward Cuba, because obviously they got to send messages home, what do we do and wait to get messages back, we'll retreat too. 
and like maybe a good defensive guard in basketball will stay between them and Cuba so they can't get there. At the time, the Canadian Navy was strong enough, it was able to take over the defense of the North Atlantic. Because basically, NATO doesn't work if you don't hold on to Iceland. And if you don't know that, read Tom Clancy's Red Storm Rising. <laughs> right? Isn't that, what, isn't that what it's about? Is Iceland makes the, the, war, the war winnable? Even if he's not right, it's a cool novel, and he just died, so what the hell? He needs more money. Um, so they meet, and they come up with this idea of quarantine. And the Soviets will send attack subs to guard their merchant fleet, and we have subs looking for their subs while we have surface ships looking for their surface ships. There's a real chance there could be a collision or something. Now, it used to be told, when I first started teaching this course, back in the seven, late 70s, we were all told that the crisis resolved itself in a way that we now know it didn't happen. But there's a guy who always used to get credit, and always used to go, what a hero. At the time, there was an ABC newsman named John Scally. He was the chief ABC reporter in Washington, D.C. And supposedly, Scali was walking from his house to somewhere, and a major Soviet official, the number two person in their embassy, walked up to him and starts walking with him wherever he's going. Can we talk? Can I use you as a back channel? I have, uh, the Soviet government would like to negotiate with the American government, and we don't know how to contact them, and we don't want to just walk in the front door. And the idea is John Scali and this Soviet official talked about how he was the back channel, and that ABC couldn't report on the story because he is the story. So the other networks scooped ABC, which is true. And back then, when you say other networks, we're talking to CBS and NBC, not like today where there's 48 news channels. They scooped ABC because John Scali's part of the story. Well, later on, we found out that when the Soviet, after the Soviet Union falls, the officials said it was a lie. And you go back to the logs, and it really didn't happen. But all the years, I, the first 10 years I taught, I always told that story in great detail. And it pictured John Scally and how bravely he gave up the chance to break the greatest story a newsman can have to save America. Instead, apparently, the Soviet ambassador caught Bobby Kennedy outside his house and talked to him. <laughs> Which sounds just as cool, but the John Scally story was really great, and it's not true. He always liked to have good stories. You know, and that one was a really good one, but it, what can you say? So at any rate, uh, the Soviet ambassador goes, let's talk, see what we can figure out. And um, they do have conversation. And what's interesting is the story told the American people to resolve it compared to the reality of what happened. The American people were told something slightly different from what others heard. So if you're a part of the American, there we go. So one thing which I like is at the time, it's obviously a fight. And so there's editorial cartoons like this one, where if you can't see it, these are nuclear warheads. And they're arm wrestling you know, over who will win. And we're right at the brink because we're sitting on the bomb each. And in case you don't know what kind of bomb it is, there's an H on each one because it's hydrogen, right? Because that's good for you or something. And then at the height of the crisis, the newspapers reported Kennedy orders a blockade. Now, Kennedy officially again called it a quarantine because it sounds medical, but the newspapers called it what they wanted. And you could see the big, bold print and three lines across the top of the page in the Washington Post. And then as the crisis begins to resolve itself, from one of the great newspapers that doesn't exist anymore, but a great newspaper, the New York Herald Tribune. Well, that's not what happened. That's what we were told, but that's not what happened. We were told that Khrushchev backed down, that he agreed to ship the missiles out. There's more negotiation. The final negotiations are in October, even though it's called the Missiles of October and half the TV programs. Uh, but instead, uh, it goes on until November. But that wasn't the deal. What Kennedy agreed to was that the Soviets would ship out the parts of the missiles they shipped, but they weren't operational yet. And in turn, we would dismantle the Jupiter missiles in Italy and Turkey. If he announced that, that's a, just a pretty straight up trade, isn't it? It's not a great victory. If you think about it, because the missile, our missiles were working and their missiles were being constructed, it almost looks like we gave up more than we got. The typical end to the story told for a long time was that this is October 62, Khrushchev backs down, and what happens two years later on October 15, 64, the Soviet government announced that Nikita Khrushchev asked to retire. And unlike his predecessors, he actually was allowed to retire, and apparently he'll spend his last days feeding the pigeons in Moscow, which I gather was a fun thing to do. But growing up in New York City, it was always the old people who fed the pigeons or the ones who talked to themselves that you didn't want to sit next to. So I think the idea of feeding pigeons, you kind of go, OK, I'm not quite that old. And I talk to myself sometimes, but not all the time. And I haven't started answering myself yet, so it's OK. 
So this is not quite true. It's really a trade. And both Khrushchev and Kennedy are somewhat rocked by how close they came to the brink. And it's not just my seventh grade teacher who was a bit of a bozo <laughs> about this, but it's just others. And what Kennedy does is he'll go to, oops, a little bit too big. He'll go to American University. He gets invited to be the commencement speaker. And American University is in Washington, D.C., so it's easy to go up. I had a really clear picture. He's not surrounded by the plexiglass that surrounds all presidents today, even though he is assassinated. For some reason, people just didn't think he was a target the way today you worry about every president. The security is excessive. If you're at the Obama rally here on campus, they uh, pulled down the curtains and all the windows on Central Campus. When some folks in Beardshire wanted to see what was going on and raise the windows, if you look, the Secret Service went running across the big concrete sidewalk to go rush up there and suddenly see these things pulled down and them being chastised by the Secret Service. Don't you ever do that again. So Kennedy gives a speech. And in the speech, he says we ought to try and stop making bigger and bigger weapons. Well, what was going on? We each were making bigger weapons, and we had above-ground tests. We were poisoning the atmosphere. And where was it showing up? Well, we're blowing up the weapons. The radioactivity falls to the ground. It gets into the grass and fruit, vegetables, grains. It gets fed to cows, and it was showing up in milk. Strontium-90. Uh, one of my former colleagues at Iowa State wrote a really good book, Alan Marcus did, about um, that problem. I mean, he's a very good science historian, uh, technology historian, Alan. And so it was poisoning, literally poisoning the environment. Mothers were giving their little babies this milk that was laced with radioactivity. And of course, their heating bills in winter might go down, but it probably wasn't a good thing in the long run. So Kennedy gives a speech, we should try and stop things. I, I joke about this other thing, but in the early 50s, a Hollywood made a movie in the desert of uh, Nevada outside Las Vegas called The Conqueror, where John Wayne played Genghis Khan. Susan Hayward played J Genghis Khan's principal wife. And of course, they both looked Mongolian. They gave John Wayne little black kind of mascara lines out here, and that was supposed to make him look Mongolian. You know, 6'4", from Winterset, Iowa, and he looked Mongolian. Every principal actor in the movie, all the principal set people, cameraman, director, die from radiation poisoning. They get different kinds of cancers. Because there are all the above ground tests in Nevada, and they're out there shooting while it's going on. And it's falling on them. So Kennedy gives a speech, very famous speech at American University. Actually, you can go online and they've posted it. American University has posted the speech. So uh, uh, not, not a photograph, not, not pictures, but the sound. You can hear an audio file. And he said we should slow down the pace of this building bigger and bigger and bigger nuclear weapons and blowing them up and we're poisoning ourselves. And if nothing else, we're poisoning the northern hemisphere. So the more that the Russians blow up, they're poisoning themselves. And the more we blow up, we're poisoning ourselves and the southern hemisphere gets away with it. We should do something about it. And so what it will lead to is the Limited Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. And you have to say limited because it is limited. It did not stop nuclear tests. They go underground. And you could go online and find um, MPEGs of the blasts in Nevada where you'll see the ground and you hear the siren go off and suddenly the ground goes up about six feet and then falls back down because they blow it up an underground chamber. Area 51. You guys aren't Area 51 freaks? Oh, man. <laughs> but Area 51 is one of the things they do there. It's why they have bigger vegetables. <laughs> they have tomatoes that big. Um, so nuclear weapon work still goes on, but it's one of the first successful signs. And part of the idea is to try and stop these weapons from at least the testing of them killing us off. Part of the idea is different, depending upon who you are. The Chinese will charge the issue is not to stop the United States and the Soviet Union from testing weapons. It's to stop others. Because if Khrushchev is removed on October 15, 64, what happens the next day? The Chinese announce they successfully exploded a nuclear device in their northwest, Lop Nor in Xinjiang province. And how do they make the press release? They announce that the white people's hold on nuclear weapons has been broken. Because the US, British, French, and Russians had weapons. And, and when they, after that line, they said, isn't it nice now? In essence, we got one. And at that point, the door opens up, and the Israelis get one a couple of years later, and the, the Indians after that, and now the Pakistanis, and it's pretty much anybody with a good Gilbert chemistry physics set can go build one. But Kennedy does sign this, and it's the beginning, uh, it becomes the beginning of efforts that lead eventually to Richard Nixon signing the SALT I Treaty, the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, uh, beginning of his presidency, and trying to cut back on, on some of the nuclear weapons 
and then the disposing of them thereafter. Now, equally interesting to me, I know you guys came to class today and you said, we just don't talk enough about tariff policy. I understand how much you like talking about the 20s and the emergency tariff and the Ford and McCumber tariff and the Smoot-Hawley tariff, because who wouldn't get excited talking about tariff policy? It's just one of those things that makes a young person's blood boil, doesn't it? OK, not. <laughs> it makes an old guy get happy. Why do you say that? Well, suitable for Christmas gifts, there's this wonderful book called Trade and Security. <laughs> you can guess who wrote it, can't you? Um, <laughs> that's about this. John Kennedy said, Shortly after he took office, when he was sitting there with his aides in one of these sort of collegiate bull sessions, he said, more than the superpower confrontation with the Soviet Union, I fear America's balance of trade deficit. So all that we just talked about to him was less important than tariff policy, and so his excitement about it equals yours. Not working, is it? More candy? <laughs> But it is true. I mean, are you worried about it? Now, what's fascinating about this is if you're to go through books written by Kennedy's advisors and key supporters in government who all wrote well and wrote frequently their memoirs and other accounts, if you look through everything they write about Kennedy foreign policy, they never mention Japan. There is no mention of Japan in any key book written by a Kennedy aide, which is amazing. Because who's the up and coming economy of the 60s? Japan. And if Kennedy said, and there's lots of witnesses to him saying it, that more than the US confrontation with the Soviet Union is balance of payments and balance of trade, you would think it would show up with some specific targets in Japan, you know, goals or, or, or activities would show up with Japan. There's a slight difference between balance of payments and balance of trade, by the way. Balance of trade is literally, we sell them a widget, they sell us a gadget, and at the end of the year, you total it up. Balance of payments also includes students going abroad. So the 1,500 Chinese students here, for example, are using money from China, whether it's their families or governments, and being spent here. So that contributes to China's negative balance of trade. On the other hand, we have troops stationed abroad. We have students who go abroad. Faculty do research trips abroad. You spend money, it adds to it. Sales of services, Microsoft, Windows. How do you calculate that? So the balance of, of, of payments is a lot bigger than the balance of trade. And at the time, the US balance of trade was starting to go negative and the balance of payments had been, and particularly the payments because it reflected all the American troops abroad. There were nearly 300,000 army troops, for example, in Germany. Well, the fact of paying them and they spend the money there, feeding them and their families, housing them and their families, war games and supplying them with US equipment and US fuel, it's a lot of money. US troops in Taiwan and Japan, in uh, Hong Kong and elsewhere, I mean, just wherever the forces are. Uh, Navy at sea, the Marine Corps at sea, Marine Expeditionary Units, whatever the case is, it's a lot of money. And Kennedy wants to do something, and he has an idea. Still believing the US economy was the strongest in the world, and it was. Still believing we could trade. Yeah. Oh, it's up there. Kennedy round. Oops. Still believing we could trade and do well with anyone in the world. What he called for was a revision of those agreements at Bretton Woods, the place in New Hampshire in 1944, where they went because the weather was nice in the summer, and they drew up things that established uh, the international trading system after World War II. He wants to revise that, and everybody would agree to reduce tariffs. After he dies, we call it the Kennedy round, because how could you pose it? He's dead. Where if he called it the Smith round, you go, I don't care about Mr. Smith or Mrs. Smith. Congress passes the bill, and what it said is it gave the President of the United States a five-year window to negotiate reciprocal tar tariff cuts. So if France agreed to cut the tariffs on strawberries and raspberries, we'd cut the tariff on French wines, whatever. And the idea then was to encourage more trade, and more trades more business, employs more people, makes more profits, it pays more taxes, on and on and on. Five-year window. John Kennedy dies. He's assassinated in Dallas. And um, Lyndon Johnson becomes president. And when there's a <coughs> secure passage with enough countries that it met the requirements of the Congressional Act, so it wouldn't just go out of uh, season, the day before it expired. They had a five-year window. He took four years, 364 days into 1967. Made it by a day. And that story, I know, it excites you as much as me. Trade and security, Cambridge Press. <laughs> Sorry. It's actually a nice book, but it's got British type, so it's got funny size because it's A4 paper kind of stuff. It isn't the same size as ours because it's meters or millimeters or centimeters or some meter thingy and not inches or part inches. 
So at any rate, Kennedy spent a lot of time on that. Johnson will spend a lot of time on it. It doesn't really work in the end. Uh, and it'll, be, this, it'll work so badly for, for several reasons. One, as we expand the effort in Vietnam, Johnson's economists go to him and say, would you tell us how you're planning on spending for the Vietnam War? And Johnson told him a story. Because he wanted to have his domestic spending. And if he told them what he intended to spend for the war effort, they would say, you have to cut something or raise taxes. And most presidents don't win re-election raising taxes. And most presidents don't win re-election saying, I'm going to send hundreds of thousands of your sons off to fight. So Johnson didn't tell him. So we wound up spending billions that weren't accounted for. It adds to the balance of payments deficit. Much of the food the GIs and Marines ate in Vietnam was locally purchased. The Philippines, Thailand, it's money being spent out, which is a minor point of military spending, but it boosted their economies hurts ours. And the other thing is no one accounted for the rise of Japan. In 1977, Honda had the second year of the Honda Accord. Toyota was still making the Corolla, but it was rear wheel drive. And Chevy came out with the Vega, promising this would be the car to take them on. And it rusted out within months. And Ford came out with the Pinto. And if you hit it from the back, it blew up. Because <laughs> the gas tank was placed in a way that if you hit it, you hit the gas tank, then the gas spilled onto hot parts of the car, and that ignited, and then you died. So uh, suddenly, Japan takes over. First, it's little Sony radios, and then it becomes Leica cameras, and, and becomes film, becomes super ships, the cargo containers, eventually cars, and just about everything else. So it doesn't work in the end, and we'll lead Richard Nixon when we get to, there we go, when we get to August um, 15th, 1971, to announce a series of measures to help the US economy, which the Japanese conclude incorrectly so it's mostly aimed at them. And in fact, the phrase enters the Japanese language, Nikosona Shaku, the Nixon shocks, because it's really aimed at them. But we'll get to that later, because again, I know how tariff policy, you know, I think that's why everybody took the course, was that description in the course catalog. Tariff policy, we're going to concentrate on that this semester, and it excited everyone. <laughs> If you go to a presidential archive and say you want to research tariff policy, the archivists just stare at you and go, why? <laughs> You're the first one. At the Johnson Library years ago, because what the book came out in, I think, 2010, so it must have been like 2008, I was there, and the Treasury archivist said, no one ever looks at these records. Well, I'd like to, because I want to look at tariff policy. No one ever looks at them. Well, then I'm the first. She said, well, maybe there's a reason. I said, maybe they just don't want to. Maybe I get a book. And she just brought me box after box. You're the first person to look at it besides me. <laughs> OK. Click, 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 take pictures. So the last thing to talk about with Kennedy, and it's the one that's really the key, is Vietnam. When Kennedy meets with Eisenhower, beside Eisenhower warning him about China, he doesn't talk about Vietnam. To him, it wasn't that big an issue. He'll warn about Laos. But in the end, it becomes a huge argument. If I go down the page, probably to the bottom. Well, there, I mean, that line there. It's a huge argument. Was Kennedy preparing to withdraw or not? It's not an argument we're going to settle today, but it comes down to a couple of documents. It comes down to words in the documents. And it comes down to statements Kennedy makes about those documents. By 1963, the situation in Vietnam isn't going well. That is, in, I, after the French leave in 1954, the US gets more involved. By the time Kennedy becomes president, there's probably 1,000 American military advisors in Vietnam. As the time goes on, by the time you get to the summer of 1963, it's over 17,000 advisors. Again, when the New York Times once asked them, are there many troops there, he just said no one walked away. Another time when they asked him how many combat troops were there, he said none, because you can't be a combat troop unless you're in your full unit. And these were individually assigned members of the US military, so they're combat advisors. He knew he was lying. But why does he do it? Because Kennedy's a committed Cold Warrior. He's a Catholic in an era where that makes you anti-communist, Pope John Paul II as the pope was a committed warrior against communism and is one of the people that causes the overthrow. And uh, Kennedy felt that after probably after being buffeted about the Bay of Pigs, buffeted about with Khrushchev in Vienna, buffeted about the Berlin Wall, and really not winning the Cuban Missile Crisis, despite what we heard at the time, he has to show he's tough. You know his boys. Got to be firm. And where's the place? The place is Vietnam. And part of it is that on the one hand, we want the government we support to do well. And on the other hand, they're not doing what we want, so we want to both threaten them and support them to do what we want. So we actually have two fights against the communist enemy and against the government we support. 
If that sounds odd, think about Afghanistan policy today. It's the same thing. Secretary Kerry landed this morning at 6 o'clock our time to go meet with the president of Afghanistan to try and come up with the status of forces agreement, without which all U.S. troops leave next year. Otherwise, you're subject to local law for anything. You always have a SOFA, by the way. SO, I mean, status of forces agreement. So it comes down to two documents. And one of the documents, and remember there was National Security uh, Council document 68, which sort of is the basis for the Cold War. Well, by the time you get to Kennedy, they have more of them. So if NSC 68 was the 68th one in the sequence, reaching back three years, and the first one was we ought to have offices, a coffee pot, desks, and chairs, now they have different kinds. There's National Security Study Memorandum and National Security Action Memorandum. Today, they're in the tens of thousands. I mean, the numbers are just incredible because there's a lot more people working, and there's computers that type on rather than typewriters, and they correct your errors, and you can get a lot more junk done. But this is 263 and 273. Document 263 comes out October 163, and Kennedy saw it and approved of it. And what it talked about was, given this roughly 17,000 advisors, it proposed to pull out 1,000 U.S. advisors the next year. Well, why are you pulling out advisors? Well, the assumption is either it's going so well we can bring them home, or it's going so badly we might as well get the heck out. I mean, it's got to be one or the other. And uh, if you read the rest of the way in the document, the uh, document reported that key American officials over there predicted that the South Vietnamese army would be able to stand on its own, defeat the communist insurgency, not need our help come 1965, so of course everybody can come home because they won. It didn't say, if they don't win, what do you do? So there's an assumption there that we're going to be victorious in 65, and we weren't. And we weren't going to be. And so it's hard to tell what that means. Well, I mean, the first draft is October, early October 1963. There's another argument that one of the reasons Kennedy agreed to that document was to give a little shot in the side to the South Vietnamese president. We didn't like his politics. I mean, uh, Americans want to believe there's always good guys and bad guys in any issue. And sometimes it's just bad guys and worse guys. Or bad guys and bad guys. But there's a national interest. But they're not always nice like us, and they're not always absolutely evil. It's not exactly Spy versus Spy, the Mad Magazine cartoon, or the Sheepdog and the Coyote and all those Warner Brothers cartoons. It's not always absolute good and absolute bad. But that's the world we want to live in. So the South Vietnamese government wasn't that great, and the North Vietnamese government wasn't that great. And you can just try and decide who was the less great or the more great. So Kennedy also figured if he announces he's going to pull out 1,000 advisors, what would the South Vietnamese government do? Oh, my God, why are you pulling them out? Well, we want you to reform. OK, I'll do it. Let them stay. So maybe he never meant to take them out, but just to give a little scare to the South Vietnamese government, our ally, to change its ways. All right, that's 263, October 1. Then on November 21st, there's a redrafting of 263. November 21st. Why do you point out November 21st? Two things. November 1, the South Vietnamese president's assassinated. And November 22, sadly, John Kennedy's assassinated in Dallas. He saw it. The notation says he read it and approved it. And it talks about, well, maybe we will, maybe we won't, because you can't abandon the fight against communism. And then after he's assassinated, at the beginning of December, there's document 273. And now it's Lyndon Johnson. And it says, because we're not winning, we're going to have to expand the effort. Did Johnson expand the effort, or was that the sequence where it was going? To this day, there's fights. There's books written on both sides. It frequently is not who you believed in. It's whether you were drafted or not and sent to Vietnam and became a historian, how you write which way. But the details of all that, that's what we pick up on Monday. Thanks a lot for coming. Go clones. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.